Section 17 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bruce Peary. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 4, Section 17. Selected Excerpts by Frédéric Bastiat, 1801-1850. to 1850. Political economy has been called the dismal science, and probably the majority think of it as either merely a matter of words and phrases, or as something too abstruse for the common mind to comprehend. It was the distinction of Bastiat that he was able to write economic tracts in such a language that he that ran might read, and to clothe the apparently dry bones with such integuments as manifested vitality under his pen questions of finance of tax of exchange became questions which concerned the lives of individual men and women with sentiments hopes and aspirations he was born at bayonne in france june nineteenth eighteen o one at nine years of age he was left an orphan but he was cared for by his grandfather and aunt he received his schooling at the College of saint Seve and at Sorez, where he was noted as a diligent student. When about twenty years of age, he was taken into the commercial house of his uncle at Bayonne. His leisure was employed in cultivating art and literature, and he became accomplished in languages and in instrumental and vocal music. He was early interested in political and social economy through the writings of Adam Smith, J. B. Say, Comte, and others and having inherited considerable landed property at mougon on the death of his grandfather in eighteen twenty seven he undertook the personal charge of it at the same time continuing his economic studies his experiment in farming did not prove successful but he rapidly developed clear ideas upon economical problems being much assisted in their consideration by frequent conferences with his neighbor m felix coudrois these two worked much together and cherished a close sympathy in thought and heart the bourgeois revolution of eighteen thirty was welcomed enthusiastically by bastiat it was a revolution of prosperous and well-instructed men willing to make sacrifices to attain an orderly and systematic method of government to him the form of the administration did not greatly matter the right to vote taxes was the right which governed the governors there is always a tendency on the part of governments to extend their powers he said the administration therefore must be under constant surveillance his motto was foi systematique à la libre activité de l'individu défiance systématique vis-à-vis -vis de l'état conçu abstraitement c'est-à-dire défiance parfaitement pure de toute hostilité de parti systematic faith in the free activity of the individual systematic distrust of the state conceived abstractly that is a distrust entirely free from prejudice his work with his pen seems to have been begun about eighteen thirty and from the first was concerned with matters of economy and government a year later he was chosen to local office and every opportunity which offered was seized upon to bring before the common people the true milk of the economic word as he conceived it the germ of his theory of values appeared in a pamphlet of 1834 and the line of his development was a steady one his leading principles being the importance of restricting the functions of government to the maintenance of order and of removing all shackles from the freedom of production and exchange through subscription to an english periodical he became familiar with cobden and the anti corn law league and his subsequent intimacy with cobden contributed much to broaden his horizon in eighteen forty four to five appeared his brilliant sophisme économique which in their kind have never been equalled and his reputation rapidly expanded he enthusiastically espoused the cause of free trade and issued a work entitled Cobden et la Ligue, ou l'agitation anglaise pour la liberté des échanges. Cobden and the League, or the English Agitation for Liberty of Exchange, 
which attracted great attention and won for its author the title of corresponding member of the institute a movement for organization in favor of tariff reform was begun of which he naturally became a leader and feeling that paris was the centre from which influence should flow to paris he removed Monsieur de molinari gives an account of his debut we still seem to see him making his first round among the journals which had shown themselves favorable to the cause of freedom of commerce he had not yet had time to call upon a parisian tailor or hatter and in truth it had not occurred to him to do so with his long hair and his small hat his large surtout and his family umbrella he would naturally be taken for a reputable countryman looking at the sights of the metropolis but his countryman's face was at the same time roguish and spiritual his large black eyes were bright and luminous and his forehead of medium breadth but squarely formed bore the imprint of thought at a glance one could see that he was a peasant of the country of montaigne and in listening to him one realized that here was a disciple of franklin he plunged at once into work and his activity was prodigious he contributed to numerous journals maintained an active correspondence with cobden kept up communications with organizations throughout the country and was always ready to meet his opponents in debate the republic of eighteen forty eight was accepted in good faith but he was strongly impressed by the extravagant schemes which accompanied the republican movement as well as by the thirst for peace which animated multitudes the provisional government had made solemn promises it must pile on taxes to enable it to keep its promises poor people how they have deceived themselves it would have been so easy and so just to have eased matters by reducing the taxes instead this is to be done by profusion of expenditure and people do not see that all this machinery amounts to taking away ten in order to return eight without counting the fact that liberty will succumb under the operation he tried to stem the tide of extravagance he published a journal the republique francaise for the express purpose of promulgating his views he entered the constituent and then the legislative assembly as a member for the department of land and spoke eloquently from the tribune he was a constitutional mugwump he cared for neither parties nor men but for ideas he was equally opposed to the domination of arbitrary power and to the tyranny of socialism he voted with the right against the left on extravagant utopian schemes and with the left against the right when he felt that the legitimate complaints of the poor and suffering were unheeded in the midst of his activity he was overcome by a trouble in the throat which induced his physicians to send him to italy the effort for relief was a vain one however and he died in rome december twenty fourth eighteen fifty his complete works mostly composed of vocational essays were printed in eighteen fifty five besides those mentioned the most important are propriété et loi property and law justice et fraternité protectionisme et communisme and harmonie économique the harmonie économique and sophisme économique have been translated and published in english petition of the manufacturers of candles wax lights lamps candlesticks street lamps snuffers extinguishers and of the producers of oil tallow rosin alcohol and generally of everything connected with lighting to messieurs the members of the chamber of deputies gentlemen you are on the right road you reject abstract theories and have little consideration for cheapness and plenty your chief care is the interest of the producer you desire to emancipate him from external competition and reserve the national market for national industry we are about to offer you an admirable opportunity of applying your what shall we call it your theory no nothing is more deceptive than theory your doctrine your system your principle but you dislike doctrines you abhor systems and as for principles you deny that there are any in social economy 
we shall say then your practice your practice without theory and without principle we are suffering from the intolerable competition of a foreign rival placed it would seem in a condition so far superior to ours for the production of light that he absolutely inundates our national market with it at a price fabulously reduced the moment he shows himself our trade leaves us all consumers apply to him and a branch of native industry having countless ramifications is all at once rendered completely stagnant this rival who is no other than the sun wages war to the knife against us and we suspect that he has been raised up by perfidious albion good policy as times go inasmuch as he displays towards that haughty island a circumspection with which he dispenses in our case what we pray for is that it may please you to pass a law ordering the shutting up of all windows skylights dormer windows outside and inside shutters curtains blinds bull's-eyes in a word of all openings holes chinks clefts and fissures by or through which the light of the sun has been in use to enter houses to the prejudice of the meritorious manufactures with which we flatter ourselves we have accommodated our country a country which in gratitude ought not to abandon us now to a strife so unequal we trust gentlemen that you will not regard this our request as a satire or refuse it without at least previously hearing the reasons which we have to urge in its support and first if you shut up as much as possible all access to natural light and create a demand for artificial light which of our french manufactures will not be encouraged by it if more tallow is consumed then there must be more oxen and sheep and consequently we shall behold the multiplication of artificial meadows meat wool hides and above all manure which is the basis and foundation of all agricultural wealth if more oil is consumed then we shall have an extended cultivation of the poppy of the olive and of rape these rich and exhausting plants will come at the right time to enable us to avail ourselves of the increased fertility which the rearing of additional cattle will impart to our lands our heaths will be covered with resinous trees numerous swarms of bees will on the mountains gather perfumed treasures now wasting their fragrance on the desert air like the flowers from which they emanate no branch of agriculture but will then exhibit a cheering development the same remark applies to navigation thousands of vessels will proceed to the whale fishery and in a short time we shall possess a navy capable of maintaining the honor of france and gratifying the patriotic aspirations of your petitioners the undersigned candle-makers and others but what shall we say of the manufacture of articles de paris henceforth you will behold gildings bronzes crystals in candlesticks in lamps in lustres in candelabra shining forth in spacious ware-rooms compared with which those of the present day can be regarded but as mere shops no poor résignier from his heights on the sea-coast no coal-miner from the depth of his sable gallery but will rejoice in higher wages and increased prosperity only have the goodness to reflect gentlemen and you will be convinced that there is perhaps no frenchman from the wealthy coal-master to the humblest vendor of lucifer matches whose lot will not be ameliorated by the success of this our petition we foresee your objections gentlemen but we know that you can oppose to us none but such as you have picked up from the effete works of the partisans of free trade we defy you to utter a single word against us which will not instantly rebound against yourselves and your entire policy you will tell us that if we gain by the protection which we seek the country will lose by it because the consumer must bear the loss we answer you have ceased to have any right to invoke the interest of the consumer for whenever his interest is found opposed to that of the producer you sacrifice the farmer you have done so for the purpose of encouraging labor and increasing employment for the same reason you should do so again you have yourself refuted this objection 
when you are told that the consumer is interested in the free importation of iron coal corn textile fabrics yes you reply but the producer is interested in their exclusion well be it so if consumers are interested in the free admission of natural light the producers of artificial light are equally interested in its prohibition but again you may say that the producer and consumer are identical if the manufacturer gain by protection he will make the agriculturist also a gainer and if agriculture prosper it will open a vent to manufactures very well if you confer upon us the monopoly of furnishing light during the day first of all we shall purchase quantities of tallow coals oils resinous substances wax alcohol besides silver iron bronze crystal to carry on our manufactures and then we and those who furnish us with such commodities having become rich will consume a great deal and impart prosperity to all the other branches of our national industry if you urge that the light of the sun is a gratuitous gift of nature and that to reject such gifts is to reject wealth itself under pretense of encouraging the means of acquiring it we would caution you against giving a death blow to your own policy remember that hitherto you have always repelled foreign products because they approximate more nearly than home products to the character of gratuitous gifts to comply with the exactions of other monopolists you have only half a motive and to repulse us simply because we stand on a stronger vantage ground than others would be to adopt the equation plus times plus equals minus in other words it would be to heap absurdity upon absurdity nature and human labor cooperate in various proportions depending on countries and climates in the production of commodities the part which nature executes is always gratuitous it is the part executed by human labor which constitutes value and is paid for if a lisbon orange sells for half the price of a paris orange it is because natural and consequently gratuitous heat does for the one what artificial and therefore expensive heat must do for the other when an orange comes to us from portugal we may conclude that it is furnished in part gratuitously in part for an onerous consideration in other words it comes to us at half price as compared with those of paris now it is precisely the gratuitous half pardon the word which we contend should be excluded you say how can natural labor sustain competition with foreign labor when the former has all the work to do and the latter only does one half the sun supplying the remainder but if this half being gratuitous determines you to exclude competition how should the whole being gratuitous induce you to admit competition if you were consistent you would while excluding as hurtful to native industry what is half gratuitous exclude a fortiori and with double zeal that which is altogether gratuitous once more when products such as coal iron corn or textile fabrics are sent to us from abroad and we can acquire them with less labor than if we made them ourselves the difference is a free gift conferred upon us the gift is more or less considerable in proportion as the difference is more or less great it amounts to a quarter a half or three quarters of the value of the product when the foreigner only asks us for three-fourths a half or a quarter of the price we should otherwise pay it is as perfect and complete as it can be when the donor like the sun in furnishing us with light asks us for nothing the question and we ask it formally is this do you desire for our country the benefit of gratuitous consumption or the pretended advantages of onerous production make your choice but be logical for as long as you exclude as you do coal iron corn foreign fabrics in proportion as their price approximates to zero what inconsistency would it be to admit the light of the sun the price of which is already at zero during the entire day stulta and puera 
there were no matter where two towns called fool town and baby town they completed at great cost a highway from the one town to the other when this was done fool town said to herself see how baby town inundates us with her products we must see to it in consequence they created and paid a body of obstructives so called because their business was to place obstacles in the way of traffic coming from baby town soon afterwards baby town did the same at the end of some centuries knowledge having in the interim made great progress the common sense of baby town enabled her to see that such reciprocal obstacles could only be reciprocally hurtful she therefore sent a diplomatist to fool town who laying aside official phraseology spoke to this effect we have made a highway and now we throw obstacles in the way of using it this is absurd it would have been better to have left things as they were we should not in that case have had to pay for making the road in the first place nor afterwards have incurred the expense of maintaining obstructives in the name of baby town i come to propose to you not to give up opposing each other all at once that would be to act upon a principle and we despise principles as much as you do but to lessen somewhat the present obstacles taking care to estimate equitably the respective sacrifices we make for this purpose so spoke the diplomatist fool town asked for time to consider the proposal and proceeded to consult in succession her manufacturers and agriculturists at length after the lapse of some years she declared that the negotiations were broken off on receiving this intimation the inhabitants of baby town held a meeting an old gentleman they always suspected he had been secretly bought by fool town rose and said the obstacles created by fool town injure our sales which is a misfortune those which we have ourselves created injure our purchases which is another misfortune with reference to the first we are powerless but the second rests with ourselves let us at least get quit of one since we cannot rid ourselves of both evils let us suppress our obstructives without requiring fool town to do the same some day no doubt she will come to know her own interests better a second counsellor a practical matter-of-fact man guiltless of any acquaintance with principles and brought up in the ways of his forefathers replied don't listen to that utopian dreamer that theorist that innovator that economist that stultomaniac we shall all be undone if the stoppages of the road are not equalized weighed and balanced between fool town and baby town there would be greater difficulty in going than in coming in exporting than in importing we should find ourselves in the same condition of inferiority relatively to fool town as avre nantes bordeaux lisbon london hamburg and new orleans are with relation to the towns situated at the sources of the seine the loire the garonne the tagus the thames the elba and the mississippi for it is more difficult for a ship to ascend than to descend a river a voice towns at the embouchures of rivers prosper more than towns at their source this is impossible same voice but it is so well if it be so they have prospered contrary to rules reasoning so conclusive convinced the assembly and the orator followed up his victory by talking largely of national independence national honor national dignity national labor inundation of products tributes murderous competition in short he carried the vote in favor of the maintenance of obstacles and if you are at all curious on the subject i can point out to you countries where you will see with your own eyes road-makers and obstructives working together on the most friendly terms possible under the orders of the same legislative assembly and at the expense of the same taxpayers the one set endeavoring to clear the road and the other set doing their utmost to render it impassable inapplicable terms from economic sophisms 
let us give up the puerility of applying to industrial competition phrases applicable to war a way of speaking which is only specious when applied to competition between two rival trades the moment we come to take into account the effect produced on the general prosperity the analogy disappears in a battle every one who is killed diminishes by so much the strength of the army in industry a workshop is shut up only when what it produced is obtained by the public from another source and in greater abundance figure a state of things where for one man killed on the spot two should rise up full of life and vigor were such a state of things possible war would no longer merit its name this however is the distinctive character of what is so absurdly called industrial war let the belgians and the english lower the price of their iron ever so much let them if they will send it to us for nothing this might extinguish some of our blast furnaces but immediately and as a necessary consequence of this very cheapness there would rise up a thousand other branches of industry more profitable than the one which had been superseded we arrive then at the conclusion that domination by labor is impossible and a contradiction in terms seeing that all superiority which manifests itself among a people means cheapness and tends only to impart force to all other nations let us banish then from political economy all terms borrowed from the military vocabulary to fight with equal weapons to conquer to crush to stifle to be beaten invasion tribute etc what do such phrases mean squeeze them and you obtain nothing yes you do obtain something for from such words proceed absurd errors and fatal and pestilent prejudices such phrases tend to arrest the fusion of nations are inimical to their peaceful universal and indissoluble alliance and retard the progress of the human race End of section seventeen.